I'm Rena Agarwal, Robert McDonough Professor of Finance and Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. I'm also the Vice Provost for Georgetown University uh, for all faculty issues. As many of you already know, Georgetown is one of the world's leading academic and research institutions, offering a transformational educational experience that prepares the next generation of global citizens to lead and make a difference in the world. The mission of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy is to provide thought leadership for global finance. The center offers innovative, influential, and thoughtful commentary, conducts relevant research that impacts practice and policy. We really believe in excellence in research to impact practice and policy. Okay. Start with excellence in research, but the research should also be relevant to market participants and to policymakers. We host dialogues and conferences involving scholars, practitioners, and policymakers on key financial market issues, just like the event today. Through these activities, the center contributes to an informed, solutions-oriented discussion regarding critical issues faced by global financial markets. We believe it's the responsibility of Georgetown University to provide unbiased analysis. We are not an advocacy group. We have no fight in the game, but we bring rigor to the discussion. We bring research to the discussion that can both uh, be helpful to policymakers and to market participants. And we are located in Washington, DC, which is certainly the nation's capital, but I also think of it as a global capital. And the center has become the go-to place it has the ability to convene people from business, policy, academia, when important issues need to be resolved. Our events have strong participation from the policy side, from the private sector side, and from academia. We regularly have speakers coming into Georgetown and to the center from the IMF, World Bank, the SEC, CFTC, White House, Capitol Hill, and so on. We've been doing this particular conference on financial markets quality for several years. And it partly is in response to the demand from market participants. Our activities at the center are built around four themes. The first one is disruptive innovation, where we cover, and we're becoming even bigger in this area, is fintech, blockchain, AI, big data, especially applied to the financial markets. The number two is responsible investing. Georgetown has been a leader in corporate governance issues. Our faculty have done tremendous research in governance and uh, that has been, I think, extremely helpful for the markets and for policymakers. So all three aspects, the E and the S and the G, and impact investing, they're very natural for us at Georgetown, based on Georgetown's value system. Market structure is our third pillar, and this conference certainly fits in into the market structure issues, but obviously overlaps with a lot of other areas. And then the world of alternatives, hedge funds, private equity, commodities, which are playing a bigger and bigger role in our markets, is the fourth area that we work in. Just to give you some examples of what we've been doing, we've conducted studies in partnership with the World Economic Forum on the complex regulatory framework for global fintech. We've released reports on blockchain and its role in financial inclusion. We've done work on leveraging data in partnership with City Ventures. Our faculty are working on a number of research projects on fintech, blockchain, and ICOs, issues that are emerging. And Chairman Clayton, many of the questions that our faculty are trying to address are questions that you have raised. And we really think it's our responsibility in academia to address the questions. We have taken the list of questions that you have raised, 
and are trying to address some of those issues in the whole area of blockchain, ICOs, and fintech. Hopefully, our in-depth analysis will be able to guide policymakers and market participants. The center is also spearheading courses on fintech and blockchain, and there's a lot of interest. We have to prepare the next generation of leaders who are well-versed in these issues. So we are offering both in terms of curriculum and extracurricular activities in these new areas that are emerging. Now, sometimes I do worry a little bit that the best and brightest might not be attracted to finance like they were 15 years ago, and we've got to make sure that they see finance as a place where there's innovation. There's a place where they see they can do good, and we want to keep some of the best and brightest in finance for sure. Uh, I also want to uh, announce that uh, former SEC Commissioner Mike P.O.R., a Georgetown alum, has joined the Center for Financial Markets and Policy as a Distinguished Policy Fellow. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Mike back to the Hilltop. He'll be here with us later today. And uh, I must thank a number of our sponsors and uh, participants today. The list is included in our program. We have uh, BlackRock and Cantor Fitzgerald, the CME Group, FTSE Russell, Emergent Technology, Evercore, Global Lex, KPMG, MSCI, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, Index IQ, State Street, Invesco, Thomson Hines, CFTC, SEC. And as my colleague John Jacobs would say, there are only two groups in the room today those who support the center, and those who will soon be supporting the center. Right? So uh, we, we are delighted to have uh, this very impressive group uh, supporting the center, and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, John, are you here somewhere? There, there you are. Uh, many of you already know John Jacobs as Mr. QQQ. John has been part of the center for three years now having had a very long and distinguished career at NASDAQ. We are thrilled to have him uh, with us and part of our team. And today's event is possible largely due to John's effort. And the person that's really responsible for putting this conference together is Jessica Divfest. De Jessica is the assistant director for the center, and I think Jessica is running around somewhere outside. So I want to thank Jessica. I also want to thank our Georgetown McDonough Marketing and Communications team. They include Chris Cormus, Teresa, Molly, Lauren. Thank you for all your help. And of course, I want to thank my finance faculty colleagues, without whose support this event would not be possible. So we have a great set of speakers, a great set of issues that we'll be addressing throughout the day. And uh, I am going to invite uh, Professor Richard Morrissey to come and introduce the next session. And uh, Richard is going to introduce Chairman Jay Clayton from the SEC and Professor David Roos. So Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rena. It's a distinct pleasure and honor to be able to introduce two colleagues and friends, uh, Chairman Clayton and Professor uh, David Roo. Uh, Jay comes from a long tradition in his family of public service, including his father, uh, who was a paratrooper in uh, Vietnam, uh, something we should never forget. As chair of the SEC, Jay runs the most important financial and securities regulator in the world. In addition to overseeing the world's largest financial market, Jay is also a voting member of the Financial Stability Board and a representative on the International Organization of Securities Commission, something that is very important to bear in mind since U.S. institutions control uh, approximately 44% of assets under management, despite only having about 4.4% of the world's population. The international financial markets are dominated uh, by U.S. institutions and need the protection of a regulator like uh, the SEC, who has, over many, many years, provided leadership to uh, the international markets. 
Um, before we ask Jay to come up here and answer some questions from Professor Rue, uh, I'm sure he will do so with his customary candor. Uh, everyone in the audience should understand that uh, despite being the chairman of the SEC, the views expressed uh, today here by Chairman Clayton are, are his personal views and do not reflect the views of the Commission. Hopefully, Jay, I got that disclaimer right. Uh, the conversation will be led by Professor uh, David Rue. Uh, Dave was the former chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Silver Lake Partners, uh, which was the largest and premier uh, tech bio firm uh, in the world. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more from uh, Jay and David. So Jay, thank you uh, for joining us on a school day. <laughs> Especially, I know you were out late trick-or-treating last night. Um, maybe we could start off for uh, people who aren't finance wonks uh, by uh, having you explain what exactly goes on at the Securities and Exchange Commission. I mean, are you guys exchanging securities? Are you commissioning exchanges? What are you doing over there? Uh, a little bit of the latter, <laughs> but it's, um, uh, we could take the entire time we have. Please don't do that. I, 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 I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna give you a chance to get your questions in. Uh, but the breadth of uh, activities uh, that we are responsible for regulating, some on our own, many with other regulators, is, is really astonishing. It goes from you know, the trading that you see reported um, on a daily basis to the equity markets, to our, to our debt markets, to um, markets that are, that are vast but not, not reported on a daily basis, um, our private debt and equity markets. Um, and then there's the investor side and the amount of time we spend protecting investors, uh, whether it's through our inspections group, uh, through our enforcement group, or through just writing rules that better protect investors. Uh, but the, we, could, we could go on for some time about the different activities. We haven't even talked about the exchanges, the clearing houses, all, all the other things that, uh, that we look at on a daily basis. That's great. So um, I'm always curious. Um, uh, you were fancy lawyer at a big Wall Street uh, firm. How'd you get this job? Did, did, did <laughs> President Trump see your LinkedIn profile or, you know, did you answer a monster.com <laughs> ad? But, gee, that I, sounds I, cool. Well, I, how, how did, I, how did I, that happen? I, I know you're a tech guy. Yeah. I, I hate to tell you, I still don't have a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Opportunity. <laughs> um, I, actually, I was, um, I was not looking for uh, this job. Um, at least not um, in any kind of active way, perhaps subconsciously. Um, and uh, through a series of events, uh, my, um, uh, I guess I became a, uh, known to the people in the transition team, uh, answered some questions about markets and things that I thought were working well in our markets and things that I thought could improve. But one thing led to another, and now I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so... You, you're, you're, you have been a private sector guy for most of your, for all of your professional life. You've now made a transition. How long have you been in the job? 18, 18 months. All right, so a year and a half. Can you give us a little um, uh, sense of uh, what this public service tour of duty is like? Maybe what's, what's been surprising, what... Uh, you know, how does, it how does it compare? Can you give us a little sense of the before and after? Um, so we touched on one of the most surprising things at the beginning, which is the, the breadth of activity for which the SEC is um, responsible. Mm -hmm. it, in the private sector, you know, we have specialization, competition, mm -hmm. et cetera, drive specialization. You become uh, uh, adept at particular things. In contrast, for the SEC, if it develops in the marketplace, we have to cover it. So it's sort of as innovation drives developments in the marketplace, it's an ever-expanding portfolio. And that, that is a, you know, a fascinating thing. So when 
you don't just uh, uh, apply for the job. You actually have to show up for a confirmation hearing where people can ask you. Can you, can you change that? Can, uh, can, <laughs> where people can ask you absolutely anything and, right. and, and typically do. Can you maybe tell us uh, what that was like going through the confirmation process? What was the maybe a challenging question you got asked or maybe something you didn't get asked? Uh, okay, a couple things on that. Uh, I didn't. No, I don't think anyone enjoys going through a confirmation process where people can ask anything and you have to think about your uh, you know, past 52 years of life experiences and what you've done or not done. Uh, that said, I, I was joking. I would not want to see the process change. Uh, I think I was better prepared for this job as a result of the process. You know, getting up to speed, being, re being ready for questions you don't get ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And thinking about that, so um, it was it was a rigorous and I think good experience. Don't want to do it again anytime soon, but I'm but I'm glad I went through it. Um, you know, I was I was thinking about this the other day though about the questions because the the questions stick in your mind and um, the the programmatic questions, the policy questions. Uh, I, I'm happy to tell the the senators I still think about the ones that came up, but you know what didn't come up. Through and I was I was just looking at this with the um, uh, the, the news around the 10-year anniversary of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, ICOs did not come up in my confirmation hearing, which was you know a little over a year and a half ago. That that shows you how quickly issues in our markets develop. Right, right. Um, and you've got all these different things going on. How? How can you dimensionalize for us how big is, is the SEC? How do you think about it in terms of people, budget, departments? Uh... Sure, sure. It's uh, the SEC. Let me, I'll start with the budget and kind of come back to it. The SEC budget, I, I break it into to three categories for thinking about it. It's people, which is close to 80%, kind of tech, yeah. which is getting close to 10%, and then the remainder being property, plant property and equipment. That's, so a, a substantial portion of the budget is human capital. Mm -hmm. That human capital is spread out over 11 regional offices and our home office uh, here in DC. 60% of the people in DC, 40% uh, in the regional offices. Our regional offices in many ways are eyes and ears on the ground in those regions from an inspections and enforcement standpoint and the programmatic aspects of the SEC are largely in Washington. Our trading and markets, uh, corporation finance, um, investment management, those, those functions along with our economics unit are in, uh, are in DC. And how many, people, uh, how, how many folks are there? 4,600, which is, I, I, lo I love to say this, 4,600 people and pick any mid-sized financial institution in the US, and that one institution has a lot more people than we do. It's really a tiny number compared to the number of people broadly in finance and firms that you have regulatory oversight for. Yeah, I, I, it's, um, uh, the quality of people at the SEC is really high, and if you wanna do like analysis, the fact that 4,600 people have the kind of coverage and impact and respect, that there's only one answer, they must be pretty high quality people. But how do you know that? I mean, <clears throat> I'm not doubting, but um, how, how do you think about uh, the effectiveness uh, and productivity uh, of your organization? You know, at the end of the year, uh, does somebody sit down and do a performance review for, for Jay Clayton, or how do you think about uh, you know, what your team has gotten done? Are there a set of objectives? Are there, well, it's just another great year, nothing blew up? I mean, how do, how do you think about it? So there's the, <laughs> you think about it in all those ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's the, there are the usual management tools, and we just went through a process of uh, producing a strategic plan for the next five years. That strategic plan has um, a number of goals, and we're developing the metrics. We will use those. Um, 
But uh, can I can I go on a little bit here? Is that uh, of course. Uh, on this on this yeah, issue? Yeah, you're the star. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, organizations. You've you've run a lot of organizations, invested in a lot of organizations. I think they have to have a paradigm for decision making, and uh, we have corporate governance and interests of shareholders and other stakeholders. Uh, the SEC is no different. And when I got there, there's this, the statutory mission for the SEC. You protect investors, make sure markets are running efficient, efficiently and fairly, and that we're facilitating capital formation. Those are three goals. But how do you make decisions? Um, and I kind of talked to the people there and all the different divisions, and, and I came up with a paradigm that works for me, which is if we look at someone who's going to be in our markets for the long time, someone who's investing $500 a month in their 40s because they want to have a good retirement, um, what's in their best interest? Now, capital formation is in their interest because the economy needs to grow. Efficiency is in their interest because you know, the less drag on their investments, the more they have at the end of the day. right? Investor protection is clearly in their interest. But if we look at it through what matters to them, that's a good way to make decisions. And, and it's, it kind of came organically because I think that's how people at the SEC have been making decisions for a long time. Well, that's an interesting uh, contrast because I think most people, when they think about the SEC, are thinking that the SEC is really spending all its time uh, looking at uh, what's going on in Wall Street. It's mm -hmm. kind of focused on big firms, big banks. But as you talk about it, um, what, what, what does the SEC do for small investors and, and small businesses? What, how, how, you know, give us that contrast between the public view that it's really all about a few big firms in New York and a couple in LA uh, versus um, mm -hmm. what you just described. So we do, spend, we do spend a lot of time focused on those big firms because right. they have influence in the marketplace. And if you're going to regulate a marketplace well, you need to regulate the people who have influence over it. And have okay. a recent history of misbehavior. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. That's and, and and what have we learned from the past, and what do we apply in the future? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but but you know we also think about let's go let's go to the um, let's go to the investor side of it. If we if if we have a regulatory ecosystem where that investor I talked about, the drag on their investment every year goes from one percent, or as we say, yeah. hundred bips to 50 bips mm -hmm. over the course of their investment life cycle. I was out at, and, um, out at the Pentagon yesterday talking to people about financial readiness. Now, the question at the end of people's careers is how much, how long is my money going to last? Mm -hmm. That 50 bips over a 20, 25 year investment horizon is either more dollars a month in your retirement or more years where you're comfortable you're not going to run out of money. That's a big deal. Sure. So if we can, you know, if we can, through transparency, through efficiency, through competition, drive the drag on investment for the individual investor down, um, that's a good thing. On the, on the small business side, um, you know, access to capital is so important. And there are fixed and variable costs associated with the access to capital. Um, you know, it's pretty simple math. The fixed costs for a smaller business are much more significant than they are for a, for a larger business. If we can, if we can reduce that you know, fixed cost of getting capital for those smaller businesses, that's a big deal. So in, in that regard, maybe you could comment on the fact that um, when earlier in my career, if you go back to the mid-90s, we had 8,000 public companies in the United States. Today, I think we're 3,700 or so, mm -hmm. under, under 4,000. Um, so it's dropped by half, and so it looks like there are fewer companies to invest in, um, fewer choices. Is that a good thing? Is that something that we should be worried about? I don't think it's a good thing, and I think it's something we should be worried about. Are you doing anything about it? Trying. <laughs> no, it's, it's, but it's, it's fascinating. Th th think about it. Think about it. If, um, you know, what, what that's, what, what is, the, what are the, I'd, I'd love, you know, we're here at Georgetown, people study these things. What is that data telling us? You know, and, and there are some things people say, oh, it's, uh, you know, the costs of going public, but what are the ramifications of that? 
Now, are we going to get into a world where retail investors, the investment opportunities that are available to them, are shrinking in number and in type? Because I think if you look at that, those numbers, uh, you know, you're a numbers guy, you will tell me that what comes out of that is probably that the companies that are public are now much more mature overall than they used to be, which means you probably have fewer growth companies less in growth, the public markets. Less dynamic, less dynamic companies coming to the market. Um, right. Fewer, and, and our economy is still growing. Economy's doing fine. Economy's doing fine. So where's the growth capital? It's somewhere else, and it's a place that retail investors don't have access to it. At least don't have access to it without, as I said, substantial drag. Instead of 100 bips or 50 bips, how about 500 bips for a retail investor to get into that? Yeah. It's not really the dynamic that you want. Right. Uh, maybe shifting away from that for a minute, um, could you talk a little bit about, uh, you've only got so many people, so much resources, and one of the things you're responsible for is you know, trying to ward away bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And you can do it in two ways. You can warn people away from, you know, here are things that we don't want you to do, tell that story. Mm -hmm. Or you can go bonk people on the head and prosecute people for somebody who's done something, right? I prevention versus cure. How do you decide how much time is spent kind of warding people away versus prosecuting somebody for um, uh, bad behavior? It, it's not an either or. You gotta do both. You gotta do both and you have to use those two different types of resources plus one that's sort of a, I would say quasi in the middle which is inspections. You gotta, you gotta use those to their greatest effect. So what types of matters is bopping people on the head gonna have the greatest effect? Right. What types of matters is saying, you know, we don't like that. If you don't clean it up, uh, you're gonna get bopped on the head. And then what types of matters are we saying, hey, show us what you're doing because we're watching. Right. And those are, but you, you allocate your resources um, in each of those areas as best you can. And, and we, we, are, we are being very transparent about what we're doing. So in our inspections group, we put out risk alerts and we put out exam priorities. We say, here are things that we're seeing that, that trouble us from a risk perspective for um, you know, our financial intermediaries and, mm -hmm. and, and financial utilities, and here are things we're going to inspect for because we want to know that you're doing them right. Um, and then on the enforcement side, I think our enforcement directors have been very good about setting out priorities. Could you talk a little bit in, in that, um, kind of maybe following on there, a little bit about the difference between the way the SEC operates uh, here versus what's going on in other major financial centers, Britain, EU, uh, Japan, China, uh, you know, the kind of the big other markets, um, a little compare and contrast perhaps. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit of a, a patriot here uh, because uh, I think the way we have approached regulation over the years has in many ways informed and to some extent driven the way our industrialized colleagues have approached regulation. And the reason is, it's worked really well, okay? Um, I, I, think, I think Professor Morrissey mentioned some of this, but this, these are stark statistics. We have 4.4% of the world population. We have 65 of the largest 100 public companies, our US-centric, US-listed companies. Uh, assets under management you know, are around 40, 50 percent uh, uh, here in the United States. If you're a regulator in those other jurisdictions, you're, you're looking here and say, what are they doing right? Um, and, you know, look, global economic growth is good for all of us. I'm happy to have a dialogue. I'm happy if they're doing things right to, to think about it. Um, so we do exchange ideas. Um, we exchange ideas around regulation. We particularly exchange ideas around um, systemic risks. Uh, but in large part, securities regulation in industrialized economies is pretty similar. Uh, it's based on high quality numbers, transparency, and in high quality numbers, there, there's no substitute for audit quality. 
and there's no substitute for transparency. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, confidence. Do people have confidence in the way the markets are working? If audit quality is so important, how come we only have four auditors? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> what, I, what I was asking is that there's really only four big uh, auditing firms uh, in the world. All of them do a very good job, but it's an unusual thing uh, mm -hmm. that there would only be four when there was recently, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, eight. So there, if, you're a, if you're a company choosing, there are many fewer choices uh, out there. Um, mm -hmm. There, there, are, there are fewer choices out there, and, and the, I will just say as globalization has increased, and firms have become more global, and uh, the, the complexity involved in auditing has increased. For sure. Yeah. So scale, scale is important to be able to provide high-quality audits for large companies. Yeah. What, uh, what, what's the, as you, I mean, the, the, the scale, the transparency, the depth of the markets here in the U.S. are uh, envy of the world. What, what's the risk? What, uh, what is it that we need to guard against that keeps things that way? I mean, what do you, what do you worry about in the shower, commute in the work, you know, in the morning? Um, I, I ask, the, the whack-a-mole game. That I, I, I ask myself that question multiple times a day. Are there, are there things that we're missing? Um, that would undermine confidence, that would result in um, you know, prices uh, reacting uh, incredibly negatively um, quickly. Those, those types of questions. Um, and what have we learned from the past um, is informative, but each new crisis is different from the ones of the past. Well, you mentioned earlier that um it was surprising that you didn't get asked about cryptocurrencies, even because when that was happening, it hadn't really blown up in the US yet, but it was already the rage in Korea. It was big in China. Uh, Silicon Valley was already bubbling mm -hmm. uh, with it. Now it sort of burst onto the uh, well, scene to, more to, prominently. Yeah. To, to be fair, at that time, it had not burst onto the retail scene. Right. And shortly after I got into uh, the position at the SEC, the, the crypto asset um, attractiveness burst onto the retail scene. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, how, you have something brand new like that, how does the, do you form a task force, do you hire a consultant, you know, you get some brand new thing, all of a sudden some big storm cloud comes in, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, there probably wasn't a crypto office down the hall, you could go knock on the door and Talk to that person. How do you? So we're here. At, we're how here. Do you spin it up. It's actually. I, I haven't. So we're here at Georgetown um, University. I, one of the things I don't do while I'm in this job is teach. But for for years I taught law school at a at a competing, maybe slightly better. Just, another, <laughs> institution. another institution. <laughs> another another institution, um, and uh, one close to my heart. And. Um, uh, I taught law school, and, and what I would say is, look, when you're taking a law school exam, it took me a while to figure this out. When you're taking a law school exam or when you're presented with a problem, you know, start with two things. Who's your client and what's the law? So if you look at what was happening in the, in the crypto space and the exposure of retail investors, you know, who's our client at the SEC? Our client are those investors and what's the law? And you know what? Turns out, we had a pretty good set of laws for raising capital. We managed to create a $19 trillion economy with the most vibrant capital markets in the world following those laws. And so the idea was, you know, do those laws apply to this new space? My view is they apply pretty darn well. And we set about making sure people understood how they apply. Let's, let's tell them how they apply, and then let's apply them. And we're in the process of applying them. So, so your your view is new technology, but kind of known issue because mm -hmm. uh, there's law that kind of deals with that. Um, how about where we think about new technology um, uh, uh, maybe where you think about cyber threats more gen not not cyber you know not excuse me cryptocurrency, but cyber threats. Uh, more generally, because 
one of the things that's happened in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, the flip side of efficiency mm -hmm. is it is now data dependency. All completely data dependent and computerized, right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole yeah. uh, system is now fully automated. Um, and so, how, how, what role does the SEC play in helping exchanges or companies manage that, that cyber threat? So I think a, a couple of things, and, and you, you characterize it exactly correctly. I mean, the, the dean talked about it in the introduction, big data, the importance of data driving efficiency, our use of data to, to improve trade. Well, yep. data reliance becomes data dependence, and then for, therefore protection of data is extremely important. Kind of happened fast mm -hmm. over sort of the yeah. life cycle of our economy and, sure. and, and, yeah. and, and markets. And so what is the SEC? A, a, in large part, a disclosure-based organization. And we have 4,000 public companies. One of the things to do is to say, hey, 4,000 public companies, tell us how data-dependent you are. Actually, tell us, but tell the public, tell your shareholders how data-dependent you are and what you're doing to protect that data, to have an environment that's resilient. Let's do the same thing with our market utilities with our exchanges, with our clearinghouses. You know, tell us how data dependent you are. Tell us what you're doing to make sure that you, know, you have resiliency built into your systems. You know, let's, and then we have a better, we already know we have an issue. Now we hopefully have a better handle on the contours of that issue and, and how to deal with it. And I think we're largely in that phase. So, uh Part of it is, uh, as with many things, transparency, discussion, shining a light on it. Part of it is saying, hey, and if it doesn't work, you ought to have a backup plan for how to make it work, kind of the resiliency and durability right. and, and one of the, part you, of things. You know, and one of the great things about, many great things about transparency is, you know, there's peer-to-peer -peer comparison. Right. You know, do I, do I want to, I want to do business with the person who has better data protection. Sure. I want to be in a better bank. Yeah. I want my money to be safer. I want my data to be safer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've always been curious, uh, what happens when, when, when somebody or some organization um, uh, misbehaves, uh, a fine becomes necessary, and somebody gets fined $50 million or $100 million or a billion dollars, where's that money go? Is that you guys keeping piece of that or... Is that kind of, is that, is that part of your budget, you know? This is like getting stuff for a traffic ticket in a small town. What's the deal? The, the, the money goes different places, uh, and, and to be very serious, I think to the extent our retail investors have been harmed, yeah. we should do what we can to get the money back to them, back as, to them. as efficiently as possible. You know, it, um, it does end up in the treasury on occasion because or more than occasion because... But it's you know, not bigger bonuses for SEC employees. Not that I know of. Not that you know of, no, okay. No, right. no, that's, no it's, but it's a great question because, you know, fines, we, we, we use fines for deterrent effect. Say, look, you know, we, we use fines to say, you, you're a wrongdoer, you deserve to be fined. We're telling the rest of the marketplace, if you do this, you're going to get fined, deter bad conduct in the future. But we should also use our remedial powers our ability to require monetary payments and, and, and our ability to require behavioral adjustments to, to future effect, right. to, either, well, to either compensating harmed investors or ensuring that they're better served in the future. And, um, and, and in that sense, how do you think about, oftentimes like, you know, you find a company, but it's not really the, um, the, uh, the miscreants who are getting fined, it's the company which is owned by a group of shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so the, the shareholders, in a sense, get dinged, but the, the, the bad behavior or the, beha the, the, the people who conducted the bad behavior are not always uh, punished in the same way. You know, how do you distinguish between the people and the company, I guess no, is the question. No, look, and, and, and to frame it in sort of a law school kind of way, where, yeah. where, you know, where, 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 or a business school kind of way, there, there's the argument at the one end of the spectrum, which is you shouldn't find companies uh, because it's the shareholders' money, and you're really you're really punishing shareholders mm -hmm. for, for for misconduct. 
Um, and then there's the other end, which is, you know, it, it, the company is an entity and, um, you know, you should apply the same deterrent principles to an entity that you would to an individual. Uh, like most things, life is somewhere in between. We should think about the shareholder's interests, but you have to use the tools available to you. And corporate fines are sometimes the only tools that are available to you to deter bad conduct going forward um, and, and shine a light on bad conduct. Yeah, very helpful. Um, so um, could you talk a little bit um, about uh, your background, about, I know this is the last oh, question. I, is this this is, is exactly <laughs> what you feared would happen. Yeah. Um, and you've been so nice. I've been so nice. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you seem like a nice guy. How did you end up as a lawyer? <laughs> I mean, guys, there, there's, guys, a, there's, guys there's like, a form of atonement being paid now, of course, with the public service. But nice guys like you need help too. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. But so, give us just a little bit of background. I think people are always interested to understand. Uh, you know, you grew up where you, you know, what did mom and dad do, and you know, how did you get to law school and. Uh, how did you stay alert? You know, give, just give us a little bit of... Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll give it a shot. Um, grew up in uh, central Pennsylvania, kind of rural central Pennsylvania through the sixth grade. Uh, then moved to uh, the suburbs, uh, landing for high school um, outside of Philadelphia, yeah. uh, where I met my wife and a number of, uh, of great and continuing friends. Uh, went off to college, uh, mostly as an athlete, not as a student. Uh, ended up liking college, which was a shock to many. Uh, did fine. Uh, studied engineering. Loved it. Uh, had an opportunity to go, I think we share this, uh, to go to Cambridge mm -hmm. to study economics. Studied economics. Thought about being an academic. Uh, and uh, wound up uh, at, uh, back at Penn um, and landed in the law school. Uh, thought that was an interesting place. Um, went to work for a law firm, didn't think I'd stay. And test drive. But test drive. You know, cut. I've, always, I've always been very, well, since college, been very curious about markets. Mm -hmm. And actually working at a corporate law firm was a really good way to get exposure to markets and how they operate. And... That curiosity continued to be satisfied for 20 years. And I can tell you that that curiosity is more than satisfied in my current job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jay, as, as you may know, uh, the Georgetown Finance Department is well known for its research prowess and quantitative rigor. And um, turns out that we've run a small piece of research where we have examined I thought the I thought the last question was the hardest question. No, no, no. <laughs> we have examined all of the uh, Trump administration senior appointees, done a careful analysis of background, and determined that you have the lowest golf index <laughs> of all appointees, which leads us to believe that you have probably played golf with the president, and we would like to know, or more accurately, I would like to know how good a golfer he is. <laughs> so you're getting. You thought you were going to get away yeah, without yeah, a tough yeah, question. Yeah, you're, you're, you're actually getting two answers with one question. Two answers with yeah, one yeah, question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I have played golf with the president, um, and by any measure, he's a very good golfer. I won't ask you who won. <laughs> Uh, Rena, I understand that there are some questions that have been oh. submitted by uh, members of the Georgetown community uh, and that uh, you're going to pose those on their, on their behalf? Yep, yep, thank you. So, uh, actually, my questions and the co questions from the Georgetown community are going to be a little bit easier than some of the questions that uh, Dave asked you. Uh, following uh, up... A, a, a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, following up on the discussion about public companies, and are you concerned that uh, the number of uh, 
public companies is going down, and you obviously said that you're concerned from the retail investor's point of view. The question from one of our faculty members is, uh, one of the many causes of the decline, it has to do with the increasing cost of compliance. And the specific question is, 10Ks are now twice as long as before. What is the SEC doing to reduce compliance costs that can help and enhance capital formation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, good question and, and well-framed because the words many is in there. There are many factors driving this decline in the number of public companies. Com costs of becoming and staying a public company are one of them. I think let's recognize uh, what a real issue there is, which is we have a compliant system that's largely built for very large companies. Not a surprise. We, have, we, we now have some very large companies, public companies that are very important in our marketplace, and you would build a compliance system and a reporting system that reflected that size and complexity. We should probably ask ourselves, and we are asking ourselves this question, does that compliance system work for companies that are one one hundredth the size or one one thousandth the size, don't have the same geographic? A one size fits all compliance system that's based on a global complex company? We need to think about that. So, so how do you think about uh, the request that recently BlackRock uh, uh, and other firms have put to the exchanges uh, if you become a public company, then within seven years in terms of uh, multiple voting systems at the company, wh whose responsibility is it to watch out on these governance issues? Is it the exchanges? Is it the MSCIs and the FTSE Russells of the world? Is it the SEC? Or everybody plays a role? So his, his, historically, multiple parties have played a role in the governance system of public companies, in, including most prominently our states. But we, we all play a role. Part of the role is transparency. How do you govern your company? Explain it to your shareholders. What are the laws? You know, how do you apply those laws to the way you govern? Um, exchanges have uh, criteria for listing. If you're going to become you know, a public company that has the good, good housekeeping seal of approval that you're a listed company, you know, what are, what are the standards that you need to apply in terms of governance? Um, and now we have, uh, we have new entrants on governance. Asset managers are, are asking about governance. Index providers are asking about governance. Uh, so it's, it's an issue with many interested parties. Um, let me go uh, to the second question here, which is the EU dropped its quarterly reporting requirement with no apparent harm to market quality. And uh, we understand the SEC is now looking at it. What criteria will you use to decide whether to modify the current US quarterly reporting requirements? So let's, uh, let's take a step back. Uh, the issue of quarterly reporting uh, has been raised, and it was, all, it was raised by the president. The question that a lot of people are asking are, is are we managing our public companies too much for the short term? That, that's, that's, that's a broader question. You know, the question of, of, of quarterly reporting, it's complicated. Um, we have a system that's been largely built on quarterly reporting. Um, we have investors that thirst for information in many jurisdictions. Quarterly reporting is not required, yet companies report quarterly. I think there are things that we can do to improve our periodic reporting system and provide higher quality information with less of a burden. But the question of, of short-termism is a much broader question than quarterly reporting. Thank you. Uh, the next question is sort of a much broader uh, question. So based on your experience as a US financial regulator, you're uh, obviously very well acquainted with the many shortcomings of our current system. If Congress asked you for advice, 
on some key ways to overhaul the financial regulatory system, what would you recommend? So, so sticking to my world, capital markets and not getting into to other people's uh, uh, areas of, of banking and whatnot, um, there are some shortcomings. Our job is to try and find them and fix them. Uh, what, one thing that I would love to see is the perspective that while there are shortcomings, this is a pretty incredible system that has been built. Let's, let's take a look at what we've done, rigorously and continually evaluate it and try to fix the shortcomings, but not forget how important it is to our economy um, and to the world economy. I mean, our, our, it's hard to overstate the importance of a well-functioning U.S. capital market system beyond our borders. I'll give you just one thing, prices. Having confidence in price signals is an incredibly important thing for ordering your economic affairs. Our markets provide reliable price signals around the world. That, that is an extremely important thing. If you can't rely on prices, you can't invest for the long term. You can't order your affairs. And we've managed to create a system that with some, some flaws, some problems, some things that we should take very seriously, has provided those price signals for quite a long time. Is our uh, financial regulatory system too complex? Do we have way too many regulatory bodies, CFTC and SEC and the Federal Reserve Board and OCC and uh, FDIC, and we can go on and on. And after the 2008 crisis, the idea was to consolidate but we've actually created even more regulatory agencies. And, and I completely understand that our system is complex. Let, let me give you a pragmatic answer to that. I'm not spending a whole lot of time redesigning the regulatory uh, structure of the United States. I am spending a lot of time making sure we work better together or as well as we possibly can. Uh, Chairman, uh, I want to ask you, for the benefit of the students in the audience, any advice on how they should be thinking about their careers? And as I mentioned, I think uh, students who are going into finance, they're really passionate about finance, but they want to be involved in innovation. They want to be involved in doing good. And certainly from my point of view, if you're in finance, you can be doing good. And there's a lot of innovation happening. How, what advice would you give to our young people? Uh, wow. I, I, I think it's embodied in your question, and that is follow your passion. If you're passionate about something, follow it. Find out a way to satisfy it and, or, not, or never satisfy it, but you know, keep it burning, um, following your passion. Uh, and, and in you know, finance and markets, th there are lots of places where bringing we're bringing what we have in large part here in the United States um, to bear it can have a huge effect. Actually, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give Professor Rue a lot of credit here. He said something to me a while ago, which is um, ability is widely distributed, but opportunity exists in pockets, if you think about it geographically. If you wanna be passionate about something in finance, Create more places where ability and opportunity match. 